Hey, there we go. Right, so in this session, we're going to talk about how to choose the right media channels for support and recruitment for your charity. We'll also explore the advantages and disadvantages of some specific channels, including press ads, inserts and DRTV, and show you how to get the most out of them with your targeting and creative. And I'm delighted to introduce our guest who's going to help us to do this, Maddie Bernstein. Now, Maddie is a hugely experienced media buyer who works exclusively with charities to help them find the best media to use for their fundraising and other work. And uh, Change Star have been working with Maddie for many years on a wide range of range of projects, I think, including, I think together we've been kind of pioneering some of the most successful press ads that I've seen for charities, um, and including for people like Fauna and Flora International, Concern Worldwide, and Humanist UK, and we'll probably show you a bit of that later on. So Maddie, welcome. <laughs> um, perhaps you could give us a brief introduction to yourself and to your experience in, in fundraising, particularly on recruitment stuff. Sure. So um, <clears throat> I started working, wow, well, gosh, showing my age now in the in the late 90s um, and um, I actually started out working on commercial advertise, advertisers um, so I worked on things like car insurance, um, jewellery products, funeral care products um, and um, we were lucky enough um, that um, a couple of charities um, started working with us, um, Dogs Trust and Sight Savers International and from there on in, it was pretty, pretty easy for us to sort of say goodbye to all the commercial advertisers. Um, and, um, and yeah, and then we started from there sort of working with Dogs Trust Sight Savers. Um, and, um, you know, the charity sector is actually, you know, quite small. So um, it just meant that um, we started to um, get known in the sector and from there sort of started working with um, lots of other charities, you know, like Richard was saying, Concern Worldwide, Centrepoint, um, National Deaf Children's Society um, and WWF um, and, and many others as well. Um, so across, you know, quite a broad spectrum of um, the charity sector. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I just, I kind of see working in the charity sector as a, as a little bit of a privilege. I, I, I think I would have gone a bit mad um, if um, I had carried on working in advertising in the commercial sector. Um, and, you know, one of the things I enjoy the most about, um, you know, working um, with the charities is how collaborative it is. Um, you know, the fact that we're here today, lots of um, different charities all sort of talking about our experiences and um, sort of helping each other you know you'd never find that in the commercial sector you never see sort of um, uh, you know BP and Shell or whoever sitting down and talking about <laughs> you know you know their, their, their sort of um, failures and you know what's worked and what's not um, so that's sort of um, you know some of my experience um, and um, 10 years ago or so I, I set up on my own um, and I've been very lucky and fortunate um, working with some you know wonderful charities. So the way the way we're going to try and structure this discussion is to first of all just look broadly about how to go about choosing channels for recruitment we can sort of discuss some of the basic principles and then the idea is we're going to talk through three different areas specifically of uh, paid recruitment so press ads inserts and DRTV. So perhaps let's just briefly look at the, you know, how to go about choosing channels with, for recruitment. And I think, the, I mean, the first thing I would say before we even sort of talk about this is that, you know, before you actually start spending money on support of recruitment as a charity, you really need to look at your existing touch points that you have as an organization. And we covered this in a previous fundraising call. So if you've not seen that, please do go and look at the video of that. This is the idea of really looking at every single contact point your organization has with the public and making sure you optimize each of those for fundraising. So that might be your website, it might be service users, it might be events that you have, it might be even your reception area, making sure you've got those covered and you've got them optimized to ask for funds as best as you can, because those will be the most warm prospects you're ever gonna have. And before you start spending loads of money on trying to get people in, then you want to be getting that right first. Um, but once once you've done that, Matt, if, if an organization has got a bit of budget to be able to spend on recruitment, what, what do we want to be doing? I mean, I thought, I thought the first thing is to sort of maybe sort of try and understand 
we need to understand what our aims are first about whether we want long or short term returns, how we'll measure success, that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you, you need to sort of um, decide whether you're going to ask for, for just cash or, um, you know, you're going to be asking for a direct debit ask. Um, you need to sort of, um, you know, understand um, you know, what your threshold for success is. Um, you know, you know, for the, for the charity, what what's going to be sort of acceptable? And I think um, we could probably we could probably say what that is, I and mean, we 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 are going to give out some figures and some particular examples. I mean, just as an example of what we've used with people in the past on some of these fundraising media that we're talking about. If you we would often go for a 0.6 uh, to one return on investment. So often we'd find that some yeah, press ads, for example, are doing are, are actually bringing in money. They're, they're not losing money. So if you if you're breaking even on your on a lot of your recruitment work, you're doing pretty well. If you're yeah. breaking even the first year, you're doing very well. But often when you're running running these things in greater volume, if you're able to recruit at sort of 0.6 to one or, or better, then that's that's a threshold that we've often used in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the key key thing that I've always just looked at it as you you want it to wash its face. That's 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 that, that's the aim. That's the hope. Um, you know, um, in year one. Um, but um, yeah, I I would I would sort of agree with that. Um, and then obviously you need to sort of um, establish what budget you have. Um, so that will definitely sort of um, you know steer which channels you go for. Um, so. You know whether whether you, you your budget will stretch for press inserts or DRTV. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'll go into it in a little bit more detail later. But you know there are some myths, for example, with DRTV that it can be very expensive, and that's not necessarily always the case. But um, a, a bud your budget will definitely help to sort of eliminate potentially some channels or you know the mix of channels that you can, you can use. Um, and then, you know, one of the key things you've got, you, you've got to really know who you're targeting. Um, so, you know, who is your target audience? Um, is this target audience very clear? And, you know, does it mean that you can, um, you know, advertise in very specific niche titles? For example, if you're, let's say, Christian Blind Mission, you know, can you, you know, then look at Christian titles? Um, and, um, you know, if you do have an existing donor base, you know, have you done any profiling on, on, on that donor base? Um, you know, because that's incredibly good way of sort of steering um, what you should be doing. Um, you know, it can tell you, um, you know, your donors um, hobbies, you know, whether that's gardening, um, it's reading books that can potentially open up certain fields. Um, it, it even goes into detail about, you know, what, what um, newspapers and magazines they might be reading um, so obviously if you're doing press and inserts that can be very helpful um, and you know, the same with tv i mean there's now 200 plus tv channels to choose from lots of niches um, you know including including christian um, channels as well I mean, I've, I found one of, this is one of the biggest challenges i think for certain charities you know there is there are some charities whose Target audience is very, very clear because you can actually target it directly by specific titles. So, for example, a political organization seeking social change, you'll know that they are probably going to be slightly sort of slightly left leaning so that you can place them in place in things like, you know, the new internationalists, the new statesmen. There are obvious magazines and things like that and titles that you can go into that define that audience. Whereas there are other organizations like perhaps health charities or, you know, age age charities or anything like that you know so age uk or whatever it might be that you've you've got to sort of think that they could be applicable their audience could be in a variety of different uh, titles and media and so it's trying to find any hook you possibly can find in those media that actually might help you identify people who might respond and i think we I mean, was one example we've had in the past of conservation organization called fauna and flora international and they they had quite a broad sort of target audience but what we found is that actually in the center center right press things like the telegraph and all and uh, papers like that 
they were very, very responsive. And, and it was this idea of, well, what, what is it about that audience, that sort of centre-right audience that actually really likes this stuff about the you know, conservation and preservation of things? And it's about, you've got to think really, really laterally about the target audience and about the sort of people that might be interested in it. And it, so it's, this is one of the core challenges before you choose your media, but it can also be one of the fun, most fun things and you learn a great deal about who your potential supporters could be. Yeah, not, not least on FFI, um, the fact that Sir David Attenborough um, is one of their vice presidents. <laughs> Hence why, you know, something like the Telegraph, that sort of centre-right audience, you know, they work so well, um, they work so well together. Um, but um, I've got, I've got um, a bit of an example here, actually, um, in terms of target audience which can sort of help to explain why it's so important that you really get a handle on your target audience before you do, um, you, you do any activity in channels. Um, and, and that's breast cancer care that I was lucky enough to work with. Um, and I think Richard has got the TV ad, um, which I think is worth looking at it. Um, can, can, you, can you see this? Can you see this on the screen okay, Maddie? This one, I can this, see it, yes. That it's breast cancer care? Yes. It may not be actually playing yet. So I'm, I'm not, for the, for the benefit of everybody who's watching, I'm not sure if you're going to hear the sound of this ad. So we're, we're giving it our best shot, but you'll probably see the ad playing, but you may not hear it, but you'll, you'll get an idea of what it, what's going on. So here we go. Now, this was a very interesting ad. Um, Breast Cancer Care, I mean, they were so lucky. Um, MNC Saatchi, very famous um, ad agency, um, approached them and said, we want to make you a free ad. Now, as a charity, if you're offered a free ad, that's pretty difficult to, to sort of say no to. And not only was it MNC Saatchi, MNC Saatchi managed to persuade Mike Lee, the film director, and, and this is, you know, a one-off, um, you know, Mike Lee, as far as I know, he's never done it again. He agreed to um, direct um, this TV ad. Um, and off the back of Mike Lee saying that he would do it, um, they managed to um, get 10 very famous women to agree to do it as well, as you saw. So there was Jerry, Hall um, Jerry Halliwell, Jerry Hall, Cherry Blair, Lorraine Kelly, Denise Lewis, Denise Van Outen, Zoe Ball, um, Mira Sayal. So some really incredible names. And they had all um, had some personal experience with breast cancer, whether that was some, you know, breast cancer that they had themselves, you know, or it was a family member. Um, so, you know, it, it was incredible. Um, but they had very different objectives, MNC Saatchi and breast cancer care. So dare I say it, MNC Saatchi, um, their, their, their objective was getting accolades, awards. Um, and breast cancer care, they simply wanted to get engagement and response. Um, so, you know, MNC Saatchi, having producers free of charge, felt that they, you know, actually, you know, had a lot of say here, and they were very keen for it to um, feature as a cinema ad, which is understandable because they'd had, you know, Mike Lee direct this. So um, you can understand what their thought process. But Breast Cancer Care, they actually came into our offices and they said, oh, we're in a bit of a pickle here because, um, you know, we've got this free ad, which is amazing. I mean, these 10 incredibly famous women, Mike Lee, um, but we, um, are not sure about, you know, the sort of return that we would get from, from placing it as a cinema ad. Um, now, cinema goers tend to be 16 to 44. That's, that's the sort of core target audience that go to the cinema. Um, people who get breast cancer tend to be 
45 plus. So literally cinema couldn't have been like a worse choice in terms of channel. Um, so we very quickly had to persuade them. And I, I, I'd say this is in MC Sarge, that it had to be a television ad. <clears throat> and um, to be honest, we had to fight pretty hard on this, tooth and nail really, because uh, they didn't even really want a telephone number on the ad. They didn't want a website address. They wanted it just to be this beautifully cut ad from Mike Lee. <laughs> they didn't want it to do its job as an actual fundraising ad. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> the charity, you know, was so grateful that, you know, we sort of fought this corner um, and, and you know, persuaded them um, that, you know, TV ad was the way to go. Um, and um, the same sort of thing actually happened. They also had something in print and they wanted a big billboard ad, you know, you know, you know, like on Piccadilly Circus or something, <laughs> something along those lines. And we had to sort of say, well, no, you, <laughs> you need press ads here um, and you need it in national newspapers. Um, and, you know, you've got to have the response mechanisms on it because um, otherwise, you know, it, it's kind of really quite useless. But it just it just it just goes to show that, um, you know, your your channel choice and, and knowing your target audience, you know, really does make you know a big sort of difference there. I, I, th I think there's another point that comes out of this as well, is that the way that you produce the creative or anything else in this is that you are you are trying to get response. You are trying to generate money with this. And so it it follows all the other good direct marketing principles of, you know, good call to action, strong need, all these things, and not being put off by creative, you know, sort of uh, fripperies that might win awards or that might make people think yeah. it's a great ad. As we'll show you later on in some of these things, some of the things that we produce that have been most successful have not been the most beautiful looking things, but they have followed the right principles for generating response. And I think it's probably a good time now to go on to those because we've yeah, got... I, uh, I, and just to say on that breast cancer care ad, I mean, we didn't really win because if it had been our choice, we would have had a ticker tape throughout the ad with the telephone number and the website address. I mean, it was a compromise. Um, but, um, but, you know, at least it went out with those response points. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the other thing I would say before we talk about the, the specific media like press ads inserts and DITV is the final thing to do before you start doing this is to develop a proper plan um, and to do and when you start going out in this it will simply be about testing you, know, you, you, you will have no idea whether these things are going to work or not so make sure you have a plan of the items that you're going to test whether it's about the channels the different media you're going to test within each of the channels and then the creative things that you're going to test within each of those have a basic plan and be prepared for that to change as you go along so the, the way that we normally build them is we would build for the first set of activities say we were doing in september this year we would have we would test say seven uh, seven insert titles then we would we would plan in that in maybe january once we've got the results back then we would roll those out and we would have you know say i don't know a couple of hundred thousand of those to, to, to mail out again but we wouldn't know wh where they were going to but we would just assume that if things are if things go well in the test then we are going to put budget in to do this again at x point so that although you don't know the detail you're making a kind of a plan for if things go well but then you've also got in the back of your mind a contingency plan if the test doesn't work or if that channel isn't going to be a goer then you can always divert it into something else so that's how the sort of building of the test plan works i mean now, early, early on when i when i started working um i was you know lucky enough to work with um the late adrian burder um and tobin aldrich and ken burnett and um you know one of the things they always instilled in me is test 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 um and not to be afraid of failure as well um you know it was you know key that actually you know we got learnings from those failures um you know because i've come across a lot of uh, charities over the years you know wh where you know the failures have sort of been swept under the carpet and sort of put in a box actually it's really important to dig out those failures because then you know that will actually um you know be learnings for you in terms of what not to do <laughs> absolutely and yeah not to repeat <laughs> and the thing is you're starting from a position a lot of charities in this start from a position of basically knowing very very little at all about what their audiences work 
about what what channels they can use, what media titles work. So you're almost starting from a position of complete ignorance. And so the, so the tests, the tests not working are helping you to find your way towards the ones that will. So it's worth seeing it in yeah. a positive way. So let's let's have a quick look then at, at press ads. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at press ads, inserts, and DRTV for each of those channels. We're going to give you just a very brief introduction to it about its advantages and disadvantages, and perhaps when you might use it and when you might not. So I think, Maddie, from my point of view on press, press is a really great thing to be to test um, er, early on when you're early in your sort of. Uh, looks at looking at um recruitment uh paid recruitment because it can be relatively relatively economical to do so you're not having to fork out a load of money to get loads of stuff printed up it can be quite flexible as well because you can buy press uh, space very very quickly even within sort of 48 24 hours um, and you can you can learn things quite quickly the response comes in fairly quickly so that you can then make decisions roll out quickly and yet you can get you can get ahead of steam quite well what, what, what do you think are some of the good, good and bad things about press? Yeah, I mean, dare I say it? Um, I mean, um, you know, press is um, seen as a trusted medium, although you could argue that, <laughs> um, especially in, in, in our sort of current times. But, um, you know, especially sort of an older audience, they, they, they really do trust the newspapers that they read and the publications that you read. Um, you know, one of the other wonderful things about <clears throat> press uh, is a very old technique, technique called AB split testing. It's not as available as it was maybe 20 years ago, um, but it, it, it is there um, and it allows you to potentially test, you know, um, different image, different ask. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely, a, you know, a very useful technique to, to, to have. Um, in, in my view, you need very little brand awareness um, to do press advertising. Um, you need a strong proposition. Um, but actually, you know, the, what charity you are is not really that relevant, in my view. You don't have to be an Oxfam, um, you know, um, in order to get response. Um, it, as you said, it's, um, it's, it's cheap, it's flexible, um, it's quick. Um, you know, um, you, you, can, you can literally sort of, um, yeah, I, I remember, um, you might remember this, Richard, um, Our World, Our Say, when um, there was the Iraq war, um, there was a demonstration in Hyde Park um, where a huge number of people turned up. I think it was 100,000. 100, I, I want to say a million, but I think it was 100,000 people turned up. Um, and, um, you know, we managed to get an ad into the paper the next day at sort of really late in the day, like four o'clock. Um, so um, it can be very quick. Um, I think of it as a considered approach. Um, so print, I think of it as more considered approach compared to something, let's say like DRTV. Um, and what I mean by that is that it's, it's in paper format, it's in front of you. It means you can spend time with it um, and, and actually um, you know, really consider um, you know, the proposition. Um, there's a huge plethora of titles to choose from, from very broad mass market um, newspaper titles um, to very niche, um, uh, you know, titles on, I mean, it's almost extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, the number of magazine <laughs> titles and periodicals, it's in incredible. And it's great because you can drill down. I mean, I, I guess, I guess the, the challenge that comes alongside that is, you know, you, you can actually start by targeting, you know, maybe three or four really, really appropriate titles that are just right for you. And the challenge sometimes for organisations when those tests go well is then how do you roll that out and actually get volume after, after doing that? Because yeah. one of the arts of press, if it's going well for you, is to kind of go, well, how do we get, how do we use these titles that we know work for us, uh, but not overuse them so that, you know, that the response rate goes right down. And I think that's a bit of an art in itself, isn't it? Planning, you know, maybe using them maybe three times a year or something like that and not overdoing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there's a sort of trap that people fall into, you know, often, which is, you know, they, they, they find out that, you know, let's say that the Telegraph works really well, and so they go into it again and again, and, you know, typically what happens then is that, you know, the, the response curve comes down, so it, it is incredibly important that you, you spread, you know, those insertions out, um, and that you have, um, you know, you know, different copy 
that you're putting into the, that title because that audience will be craving something, you know, an update, um, you know, craving something new from you. Um, but you know, the, 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 there are some disadvantages to press. Um, um, you know, one of them, especially at the moment, is declining um, circulations. Um, you know, and I see that, and it's um, as a media buyer, it's incredibly important that I stay on top of that, um, and I keep pushing the prices down. So, um, you know, in the twenty plus years that I've been working um, in media buying, um, you know, my rates have never gone up. And they've always been coming down because, you know, as the circulations come down, actually, you know, your rate is yeah. going up yeah. <laughs> in terms of a cost per thousand. So it's, you know, um, quite key. But having said that, um, you know, in, in 20 years um, from, from when I first started to sort of now, you know, I still, you know, have this incredible um, experience of charities who do incredibly well from press advertising and are able to get, you know, ads to wash their face. Um, but I thought um, a, a good example here um, in terms of, um, you know, how to do press advertising um, and some of the key principles was, um, was something I worked on um, Women's Royal Voluntary Service, um, um, now known as RVS. So um, they, they dropped the women's part of it. Um, so they're, they're, they've got quite low brand awareness. Um, they supply, they're like known as the fifth emergency service, providing in times of emergency, things like Meals on Wheels, um, you know, they, they'll go and do visits in hospitals, um, they'll organize lunch clubs. Um, and um, many moons ago, um, there was some severe flooding um, here in the UK, uh, primarily in Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. And uh, it's just so happened that WRBS is head office was actually in Oxfordshire and, and they themselves were underwater. <laughs> um, and there was a client there, Michael Dennett, who's now um, at WWF, um, who um, immediately thought, right, what can I do? So rather than sort of dealing with the flooding in the office, he was like, right, I, I, you know, we need to do something here. Um, and incredibly, um, in just over a month, they managed to raise £250,000 um, with an ROI of eight to one um, and um, a budget of only £31,000. Um, and the key thing here was timing, timing, timing. Um, so he was able to, um, you know, make some very quick decisions and act incredibly quickly. Um, you know, you know, he he had um, you know, some issues, things like um, you know, UK emergency had never been tested before. Um, WRVS had a incredibly low brand awareness. However, um, it was um, in the news. There was a media spotlight on it. Um, you know, these were some of the worst floods in living memory, um, and you know, potentially this was you know a great way of getting a new donor stream in. Um, and, you know, an opportunity to also build some awareness as well. And I'd say this thing about things being in the news, the great thing about press is that it means you can react quite quickly, but you can also build a, a whole recruitment strategy on issues that are in the news that relate to yeah. your charity. So yeah. if there is something that is coming up, even, even that comes up you know, on a particular day, and you can think, well, we could bounce on the back of this tomorrow even. We could actually put out yeah. a press ad. So we, in the past, we've done press ads which have turned around in 24 hours to actually then get them out so that people actually react to them as quickly as possible. And this could be, if you're finding it hard as well as a charity to kind of find the exact target audience you want, if you can find a creative approach that links to news stories, then that really, really helps to ramp up the urgency and the need within your, with your cause. Absolutely. So, you know, just to put this into like a little bit of a timeline, um, the WRVS head office flooded on the 20th of July. On the 23rd of July, um, the client, Michael Dent, decided to brief the emergency services at five o'clock. Um, at six o'clock, he called us and asked us what we could do in terms of media. Um, by seven o'clock, he'd um, briefed the creative agency. Um, that morning, at four in the morning, um, the, the creative agency supplied copy. Um, 
by 11 o'clock the next morning, we had booked the media. Um, the newspapers, they, they, they tend to have a morning meeting, um, which ends about half 10. So, uh, you know, by 11 o'clock, we booked that. And by five o'clock that afternoon, the artwork for those ads had been supplied. So here you can see, um, this was actually the Independent, which uh, is no longer, um, when it closed, um, a sister paper opened up called I. But um, this was on the weather page. So uh, obviously, you know, serious flooding on the weather page. Um, and, um, you know, this was a 25 by four um, black and white ad. Um, so that ran the following day on the 25th of July. Uh, by the 27th of July, they'd received a gift of £50,000, a one-off gift of £50,000. And the client went, right, hang on a second, I've really got something here. This is incredibly responsive. It's obviously resonating, um, you know, with the public. Um, you know, I need to now do a full page ad. Um, so they then decided to, and, and by this point, they'd, 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 they could see that the Telegraph ads were outperforming anything else. Um, so they decided to do a full page ad um, on the 28th of July. Um, and generally speaking, I think Richard would, would um, you know, testify to this, is that in my, in my view, big sizes tend to work best because of the long copy, the fact that you are able to actually impart even more um, information. Um, I think this is I think this is an absolutely critical part of press ads and it, from a, from a creative side is that the you know the, the the ad that Maddie just showed you the sort of sort of small small ad that those those can be useful in terms of sort of name generating and things like that and sometimes but if you really want to give your ads the best chart it's to do full page um, because those will you know, they they basically dominate the page and also in having a a cut off slip at the bottom it means that there's no no one's actually worried about sort of uh, cutting that or damaging their their paper or their magazine because they know that is the only thing that's on that page so it just it is just way of dominating the page with your message that is yeah that is by far the the, the, the most yeah. effective way that we've found and uh, maddie i'm really sorry on this but we i think we're going to have to kind of rush through some of these and i, I knew no, this, i know i knew this would be because we've got so much stuff to share today with people <laughs> this is really yeah difficult. So, yeah okay yeah no, no, that's 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 um fair enough um do you think we should move on to um inserts should we yeah should we do i tell you what we could do i tell you what i will do as well let me just stop that share and, and show you another example of another of another yeah. ad just to give you a, just to give people a, a quick idea of other ways you can do this um so uh where are we there we go. So hopefully you can see this. So this is one that we did uh, for uh, Fauna and Flora International. So this is another full page press ad. As, a, as you can see, it's not the most glamorous uh, item uh, in, in the world that you've ever seen. And it's just, it's the idea is it's sort of an editorial ad to look as if it's a sort of editorial within the style of that paper. I, um, I think one of the key things here is, is um, the menu of asks and the fact that you have got a large ask there so in this case you know there's a two thousand pound ask and also a fifteen thousand pound ask um and uh, you know uh, my view is that it's incredibly important to think big when it comes to ask um so that those few people who can do actually give those sort of large donations um because if you if you only ask for two pounds a month even the wealthiest um, you know, donor will we'll then give you two pounds a month. Um, and um, it's kind of been proven again and again, hasn't it, Richard? You know, um, Concern Worldwide, um, WRVS, um, here with Fauna and Flora International, um, you know, consistently, you know, you know, over the years, uh, those large gifts have been forthcoming. Um, absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah. Um, I, I think yeah, so. I mean, so we we could we could probably do an entire session on press ads because it is a really no no it's 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 such an interesting area to look at. And if anybody are at the end of this session would like more on this, then we 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 can I'm sure we can happily do another session on this because there's some really useful detail I think we can do. Um, okay. Perhaps we could. Sorry, mate. Could, yeah, if we could briefly yeah. go on to inserts and then we'll quickly yeah. talk about DRT because I'd love to show a, a couple of the ads that you've got. So yeah. inserts. Here we go. Yeah, so I mean, inserts, um, you know, there's there's often preconceptions about inserts, you know, that they're 
<clears throat> a throwaway item. Um, and um, <clears throat> I do clearly remember um, one of our clients, um, Tobin, um, driving along a road and it was a bonfire um, and he realized that it was his inserts that were on fire. But, but you know, Tobin <laughs> said to me, you know, despite that, Tobin always said to me, no, but the results, you know, it, it's black and white, the results, they really do work. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that's um, you know, a bit of a misconception. Um, they, they are, you know, great uh, in terms of you being able to <clears throat> target geographically. So, you know, you, you could just um, send these inserts into Anglia. Um, you know, they're easy to measure. Um, they've got longevity, even more so than press, because they, they fall out of the magazine and someone goes, oh, I haven't got time to, you know, look at that now, but I'll put it over here. So, I mean, I remember with Sight Savers actually having people responding to an insert because they're all coded, so easily measurable, 10 years after the fact. They obviously were then clearing, you know, a pile of paperwork out 10 years later and, oh, hang on, I haven't responded to that. I meant to do that. Well, wow, that's a nice response curve, isn't it? Sort of, yeah. Uh, and actually, in terms of long copy, you can do even longer copy with an insert because, you know, here's MSF. Um, you know, they've been, they've been doing these for well, at least a decade. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, I see it as an even more considered approach, you, you know, because you, you take that leaflet away, you spend even more time with it before you um, make that decision to, to actually respond. Again, you can do the A-B split tests and there you can, you can do as many A-B splits as you like, mm. um, whilst your oyster. Um, in terms of, um, you know, inserts that work, um, you know, th there's a wide ranging ones. Um, you know, here's one, um, from Emmaus, who's a homeless ch this charity. I think here, sort of bigging up the creatives here, um, copywriting is such a skill. So it says, I am a piece of paper. Um, and um, it's about getting those readers to go, hang on a second, I'm a, you know, wanting to find out more. Um, and, um, you know, I remember Sight Savers um, in the late nineties, they ran, uh, an insert where it, it said it's what all the girls are wearing and they uh, this, it was just sort of a picture um, of a girl who had a necklace on with a pair of tweezers on it and you just wanted to open it up and find out why why is she wearing you know tweezers around her neck and it was because of um, trachoma this you know awful sort of um, uh, situation where you know your, your eyelashes were sort of actually growing inwards um and eventually blinding you so they they needed to sort of pluck them out um and and that was um you know a chap called george smith um you know the, the sort of guru of the creative world um incredible sort of copywriter from smith mm. um and you know he, he he was um you know the one who came up with that um for sight savers I mean, another thing I would say, Maddie, about um, inserts that's quite useful is that you can use um, press ads to sort of preempt them and to test them because press is yeah. a kind of relatively quick and simple way to do things. And if, if something's working in a, tit a particular title for, for press, then you may be able to investigate inserts in that same title. And so yeah. those, those two things can actually run along side by side. And even a step sort of back, what you were saying earlier, um, you know, if you, if you feel, first of all, looking at you know dm and and your own existing donor base then actually um you, you can use what works in dm and then translate that into inserts so if you've got something that really explodes on, in terms of your dm packs then um then you know it's something that you can potentially then transpose into, into absolutely inserts. i mean there are some disadvantages don't get me wrong um it's it, it can be slow because you've got to get those inserts printed up so you know you can print them. I mean, I, I remember printing up for that March um, for our world essay an insert um, within a week. Um, but typically, you know, it's kind of six to eight weeks. I mean, you know, it, it depends on your printer. Um, you know, I, I think it's actually better now than it maybe was 20 years ago. And it's probably like sort of a four week lead time. Um, but, you know, there's the additional cost of actually printing up the inserts, um, you know, and, and there there is this you know, issue about wastage. Um, so, um, you know, a, a title might have a circulation, let's say, of 100,000, 
Um, but their print run is actually 130,000 because 30 of the 30,000 go out, but they actually get returned. Um, so, you know, there, there are definitely sort of downsides as well that you just need to be sort of aware of. Um, I, th I think what I might do, if it's all right, if we, if we might just go on to, because I know, I know you want to talk about DRTV because there are a lot of you know, pre preconceptions and misconceptions about DRTV and about whether it's usable for, for, for charities or not. And I wonder if we could maybe just spend our last sort of five, five, six minutes yeah. talk, talking sure. about that a little bit. So um, advantages and disadvantages, I think that this, this links in well. What, where would you say that's on DRTV? Um, so DRTV, I think, is very different from print. Um, it's incredibly emotive. So the response is immediate. So it's not a considered approach. It's something that, you know, um, you, know you, you see something very emotive and, and you want to respond there and then. Um, yes, there's a trickle of some response that comes in later, but the bulk of it will come in, you know, immediately. Um, it is something that I think needs a very strong emotive proposition. Um, and, and you will know whether, you know, you have that. Um, but yeah, if you do, it's highly responsive and you can reach a very big mass audience. Um, it's got, um, you know, this halo effect on other channels that you use. Um, and, um, you know, you can target very specific audiences um, here in the UK. Um, you know, we have one of the most advanced sort of, um, sort of audience um, targeting systems um, in the world. Um, there, there are um, some myths about TV. Um, the fact well, that we know what the big one is. Expensive. We know what everybody wants to know. They, everyone thinks this is really expensive. I can't afford to do this. It's, that's not necessarily true. I'm not saying it can't be expensive, but it's not necessarily true. Um, there, there's also a myth that it can be very slow. That's not true either. You know, you can actually get on TV incredibly quickly. Um, um, you know. But, um, but you, you are limited. I mean, you've got, you know, um, let's say there's a big media story, right? You could maybe then get away with a 30 second ad, but typically direct response television is a much longer form, um, but that's still only like 60 seconds or 90 seconds to get your proposition across. So, you know, there is this time constraint. Um, there's a lot of logistics and back office that you need to think of things like telemarketing bureaus your website whether it's going to be a one-stage ask a two-stage ask whether you need to send out more information um whether it's going to be a text response in which case you need to be you know you need as soon as you get that text you need to be responding within the hour um, yeah. there's no good sort of falling asleep and then you know calling them back a week later because they're all forgotten <laughs> you need you need the processes and the fulfillment all backing this up don't you to actually make it work properly um, yeah i mean i i also i also get the sense that i think one of the things we were talking about a, a few days ago was how that i think there's a misconception that drtv ads all, all have to be expensively produced and have to have very specific footage done for them and it's going to cost you you know, fifty thousand pounds to do one. I think one thing that perhaps would be really nice to show people, if we may, is to show yeah. you don't even have to have um, proper filmed footage for your DRTV ads for them to work. Yeah. You can just use still photos. So perhaps we could. Shall I show them the, uh, yeah. the concern one? So this is this is just an example of why you don't have to spend loads of money on on ads. Here we go. Right. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. So with concern um, that they were, um, they're, they're basically like uh, the Republic of Ireland's equivalent of the British Red Cross. So they're, they're the biggest charity over there. Um, and, and they work with um, the 20 lowest income countries in the world. But whenever there was an emergency, they were able to act incredibly quickly. Um, and that was the key, again, timing, sort of timing, timing. 
Um, so if there was an earthquake, um, you know, they would get an, this sort of ad that you've just seen turned around in 48 hours. <laughs> and that's including getting it um, clear cast approval. Um, so when you do a directive ad, you need clear cost to approve your ad before it can go on, on air. Um, and, um, you know, there, there are different ways that you can make sure that that sort of happens because under normal circumstances, that would sort of take weeks and months. Um, but here, basically, you were getting, um, you know, the news outlets to do all the hard work for you. So what we would actually do was, was put this on Channel 4 News. So we get Jon Snow to do all the hard work. So, you know, he, he would be talking about it from 7 o'clock to 7.15. And at 7.15, um, we would get in there with a 30 second ad and literally we would have, they were filled with car ads. We would literally just get Channel 4 to boot out the car ad, Honda, whoever, and, uh, and we would just get in there. Um, and, you know, all we needed really was the telephone number and the website address. Um, and, you know, this was incredibly, um, you know, effective. Um, and, you know, these ads, they only cost £5,000. And I think the, the key thing is, that, you know, you can, these can just be cobbled together, basically. You know, the, the imagery and the way it looks like can just be put together. You, if you build the copy and the actual things that you want to say and the ask, the need and the, the point you want to make, you can then cobble together stuff on top of that to actually deliver that and make it an ad, make it a DRTV ad. And it can be just as effective. So I hope, I think this was a really important thing that we wanted to mention is that, you know, it doesn't have to be completely out of your league in terms of costs. It can be something that you can use as part of a, as, as a part of a normal individual giving program.